So anyway, I uh, wanted to thank everyone for um, coming back for our lecture. This is uh, Plant Animal Interactions, and we're going to talk about the Mexican bean beetle today. And I think you'll see some basic principles, other than the virus being spelled wrong, <laughs> um, on these slides. Okay, so let me tell you a little bit about the Mexican bean beetle. And you'll see this is a plant herbivore story that can tell you a little bit about the scientific method. And so here we have the Mexican bean beetle, Epilonchus verivestus. And obviously it looks like something to everybody, I'm sure. It looks like a lady beetle, doesn't it? And if you know anything about lady beetles, most lady beetles are not herbivores, but they're carnivores. So while this uh, Mexican bean beetle is related to the other lady beetles, this particular one is actually a herbivore. So that was, is one of the things that makes it unique. And so it'll feed on bean plants, soybean plants, other types of bean plants. And it will, um, does it in a weird, interesting kind of way. It will actually chew on the leaves mashing the leaves in such a way that the juices flow into its mouth. And what ends up happening is instead of like a, a um, you know, a caterpillar that's chewing off the leaves and is chewing on the edge, this one's just kind of mashing it. So the leaf has kind of a lace-like appearance with holes in it everywhere. The other thing kind of interesting th thing about this beetle, and I think this might be true for other lady uh, beetles, ladybugs, is their defense mechanism to avoid being eaten is kind of unique. Um, their joints can actually release a little bit of their blood. I think their blood may have a distasteful aspect to it, or at least a kind of a startle response. And some herbivore, or excuse me, some predators will leave them, leave her, or leave him alone when they bite on it because of this blood that'll kind of leak out of their joints. So it's kind of a defense response. This may be some that's actually on the leaf there. If you're not real familiar with beetles, obviously they're in a coleopterans, coleoptera. This is easily one of the most successful orders of animals on earth, beetles. The diversity of beetles is incredible. There's probably over half a million different species of beetle. They have a hardened shell called an elytra, and underneath it are soft wings. <clears throat> so here's the lace-like appearance from the damage from the Mexican bean beetle. So you can see it's been chewing on the leaf and uh, just all sorts of holes and kind of gives it a, like, a, like I said, a lace-like appearance. It's almost a scraping. The baby Mexican bean beetle is this larvae over here. And so it'll go through a complete metamorphosis, meaning it'll go from this larval state into a beetle, like a butterfly, where it goes from a caterpillar to a moth or a butterfly. So it goes through complete metamorphosis. I believe there's four larval stages. So it'll be laid down as an egg and then it'll molt and become a bigger, bigger larvae until it pupates and then becomes a beetle. And then it can fly off and chew on other uh, plants. Obviously it is a serious pest in some regions. Now, again, you should at this point be somewhat familiar with these plant defense pathways. Again, I'm keeping a lot of the detail out of it because there's all sorts of little steps in between. But this realized there's these two pathways, um, at least two pathways that plants deal with um, either pathogens or herbivores. So the beetle would normally stimulate the induced resistance pathway. So when the beetle feeds, it'll trigger jasminate and then turn on things like protease inhibitors, which again is an anti-nutritive plant defense. It basically blocks the, the beetle's ability to digest the plant's protein. 
So a lot of ways it's similar to what we've talked about in regards to the caterpillars. But there's something kind of interesting. This cat, this, excuse me, this beetle can transmit viruses. And that's what's one of the things that's a little bit different about it compared to a lot of caterpillars is this particular beetle is a vector of plant viruses. And so when the virus is spread by the beetle, it's very high likelihood that it's going to be transmitting an agent, a virus, a plant virus, that will then trigger these um, responses like salicylic acid and a variety of plant pathogen defenses. And again, you gotta realize there's, there's probably hundreds if not thousands of different defenses or responses. There may be big groupings, but there might be lots of little variants of all these kind of things. <clears throat> As I mentioned before, there's crosstalk between these two pathways. Whereas if the plant is infected by the virus, it might trigger lots of the salicylic acid and ultimately suppress maybe some of the beetle's jasminate response and vice versa. Maybe the beetle feeding on the plant might make the plant more susceptible to the virus. Now remember, viruses need vectors. They can't walk around on their own. You know, a, a, a virus needs a mosquito to spread viruses. It, and in this particular case, a variety of bean viruses are spread by this Mexican bean beetle. Let me tell you about a couple of them. One is known as the bean pod model virus. And another is known as the southern bean mosaic virus. And if you're familiar with viruses, it's, uh, this one has a protein coat. And so inside it, it is actually an RNA virus. And so obviously it's gonna have um, segments of RNA in there. If I, re I believe that's correct, uh, it's an RNA virus. So we'd probably need to use reverse transcriptase and things like that. I need to double check that I'm, I'm fairly certain. Over here, you can see the lace-like appearance again from the damage from either the larvae or the adult beetle. So they'll scrape that leaf and take the juice of it. These up here where my cursor is pointing is the eggs of the Mexican bean beetle. And this is the pupa. So it'll get in, it'll go through three or four instars or stages, molts, pupate, and then become an adult beetle that then can fly off. If the plant is infected with the virus, then that beetle can go off and infect another plant. Some things about this beetle that are a little bit unique in regards to this virus. The virus sticks on the beetle's foregut and mouth parts, as best as I remember. But, it's, and I, but it, what we know is it doesn't really replicate inside the beetle. So some viruses, like the ones that are associated with mosquitoes, the virus is constantly replicating inside the mosquito and it gets into bigger and bigger amounts. This is also true for some plant viruses and some of their vectors. So things like aphids, white flies, these are all examples of insects that vector viruses. Uh, I think you might remember aphids or white flies, but they're very much like a small speck, the, the piercing sucking mouth part. Normally those insects will trigger the systemic acquired resistance pathway more so than the induced resistance pathway. So again, what's unique about this beetle is the virus doesn't replicate inside it like it does for the white flies or the aphids and so forth. So that's kind of unique. So the, in other words, so in other words, the beetle is not becoming infected. Sometimes these viruses can have some effect on the host that's vectoring it. The other thing about the beetle, these bean plants, if it's a mature bean plant, it can probably withstand much of the virus, but it's the young bean plants that are more susceptible to the virus because the plant's growing rapidly and the virus is pretty much taking advantage of that. But again, it needs that beetle to do the initial damage on the plant for it to, the spit to come out of its mouth with the virus and affect the plant. Usually, 
if a beetle has fed on a plant, the virus leaves the beetle's mouth parts and is no longer present until it eats another piece of leaf with more virus. So in other words, you can clear the virus from the beetle after a, feeding, a small feeding bout. And then it won't get infected again, and, or the mouth parts won't have another virus stuck to it again until it feeds on another plant or another leaf that has more of that virus. And like the aphids where the virus is always presently growing and replicating, you know what I'm saying? So that's the, some big differences. So we've looked at black valentine or and pinto beans. These are pretty easy to find at a store. A lot of people eat these. But these will also feed on soybean plants and affect soybean. So again, these, this virus will affect a lot of different types of bean plants at different rates and levels. What it does to the bean plant is causes this, this I think it's called chlorophyll, uh, basically it removes the chlorophyll. And so this is a modeling appearance that you'll see on the leaf after the virus has infected the plant. And uh, when it does so, obviously this plant is not able to grow as well because the chlorophyll has been damaged. So there's a lot of stunting that can happen. The beans themselves can be shrunk down and not be very good uh, for selling for the grower or the farmer. Over here is more what a, a healthy bean leaf should look like where it's um, it may still have some virus over there, but it's not really taken hold like it hit, has here. Even if it is the same plant, this is the leaf that where the virus symptoms are really obvious. So these were some examples of some experiments that we tested um, looking at, you know, how is this virus and bean plant affecting the plant's defenses. It's going along again with the idea of those pathways. Is there some kind of benefit if the beetle spreads the virus? Will the virus infect the plant? I'll go back to this. Imagine if the beetle infects the plant, spreads the virus, maybe that plant will stimulate more of these defenses and then the beetle can kind of circumvent these harmful defenses over here. So in other words, the plant is dealing with this pest problem, right? It's dealing either with the pathogens or it's dealing with the beetle. But if the beetle gets that virus built up inside it, maybe it'll be more susceptible um, to the beetle's herbivory because the plant is dealing with this virus problem. That's one hypothesis, that's one possibility. The other possibility is when the beetle is feeding on the plant, initially it's stimulating these defenses. And so when that virus is transmitted into the plant, maybe it will be more susceptible to infection because the plant isn't dealing with the right pest problem. That, those are some ideas, some hypotheses. We have to test them to see if that's correct. And that's obviously what the point of the talk is about. So again, our objectives is we're interested in determining whether a virus and its beetle vector benefit each other by co-suppressing plant resistance. If this is the case, it might be an argument for mutualism. Mutualism is the idea that two organisms benefit each other by being having an association. Granted, you can't really argue that a virus is a, it's not a living organism but it still may be mutualistically beneficial to the beetle and maybe in ways we don't know yet. So here are some hypotheses. And whenever you do science research, whether you perfectly state it or not, and I think you should state it, particularly if you write a research paper or a thesis, you wanna have your hypothesis that's a clear statement that can be tested and, and without much ambiguity. And so one of the hypotheses is that the Mexican bean beetle larvae will have a greater body weight upon feeding or feeding on virus infected plants than non-infected plants. That's a hypothesis that I want to test. It's pretty clear cut. 
It's either going to be heavier or not. We don't know exactly if it has anything to do with those pathways, but that was where, what generated the idea. There might be other reasons why the beetle might grow better. Maybe virus infected leaf material is just more nutritious, or maybe it's less nutritious. So there's all possibilities that can happen. But again, we're testing that experiment by having a hypothesis that we can test. <clears throat> so a null hypothesis would be, um, we don't expect any difference. So a null hypothesis is they'll have equal body weights. It doesn't matter about the treatments. That's the null hypothesis. The alternative hypothesis is the beetles will actually grow um, better on non-infected leaf material than, infected, than, than, than on infected leaf material. So again, the hypothesis is the beetles will grow better on virus-infected leaves, but the alternative hypothesis is they won't. So that's what we want to test for these experiments. Um, again, this, some of this work was done a while back with a, a variety of students. So again, I'd hope um, we'll, you know, some people may do some experiments, some people may develop a research paper or whatever we decide to do a little bit later. Obviously, I've given you that option. But back in the day, I had some students do some experiments. And so what they did is they put the beetles and we grew the beetles over multiple generations on these bean plants. So this is the food. There's no artificial diet, at least in the case of what back when we did these. So we fed them on pinto beans. The reason why we chose pinto beans was that they, the pinto bean doesn't develop a virus infection. So we knew that the beetles would be virus free, more or less. <clears throat> when I first started at Western, Spencer Williams actually came um, and started going to school over here at Western. I knew him actually as a high school student at University of Arkansas. And so these are all high school students that I helped uh, teach about science back in the day, who are now probably in their mid thirties or about 40. And they are infecting these bean plants. How did we do so? And actually he took this to a science fair, high school science fair in one, or, got, or at least I think did really well. And so what they did is they took um, silica, you know, diatoms, remember the diatoms that are in oceans? Well, they have silica in their shells, and so it kind of gives a little bit of, you know, a sharp um, surface to it, like sandpaper a little bit. And so we would sprinkle on some of this um, carborundum, I believe is the actual name for it. And then we could rub the leaf and cause micro tears on the leaf, like this little bits of gravel is what it'd be kind of like. And then we could take plants that were infected, grab their virus sap, squeeze the leaf, get all that virus infected sap and rub it into the wounds. So that's how we had a bunch of plants that were infected. In other case, in other times we would have control plants where we would wound them also, but we would treat it with water. So again, we always, whenever we do an experiment, we always need to have a control that is treated like the experiments. We, if we're gonna wound one leaf, you gotta wound another. So again, this is kind of the setup for it. We got these beetles that, we've, that are kind of our control beetles, they haven't been affected. And then we've got these plants either infected or not infected and we can look at uh, larval growth. And so we took the eggs, going back to this picture here, we took these eggs randomly try to get a substantial number. I can't, I guess I'll look at the slide and see what it says. But we took those eggs and I guess it was around 20 and put them on these different treatments. This is the, if you look at the Y axis, again, remember the Y axis is the response, mean larval body weight. Day one, we can, assume that all the eggs weigh the same more or less, or at least they're so small we can't weigh them accurately. 
we put them on either healthy plants that are not infected, or we put them on plants that are infected with soybean mosaic virus or bean pod monovirus. That's what SBMV means, and BPVM, or BPVMV. And then we just watch them grow. On day seven, we weigh them, put them back on the leaves, and on day 14, we weigh them. And what we found was, and you can see it from this graph, if beetle larvae grew fed on virus infected plants, SBMV, soybean mosaic virus, or southern bean mosaic virus, bean pod monovirus, then you'll see that they had a significantly higher body weight than if they fed on non infected leaves. Looks like there was probably around almost 10 milligrams of difference. And that's pretty big when you consider how small those larvae are. I'm going back to that picture just to remind you what a larvae looks like. So we're, we're taking it from this stage to this stage and there's a 10 milligram difference. And keep in mind, what's the benefit to the beetle being bigger? Well, it's growing faster and bigger beetles are gonna lay more eggs. So this means that there is success, fitness success for the beetle to feed on virus infected leaves. So our hypothesis was demonstrated that there is a benefit for the beetles to feed on virus infected leaves. They grow faster. This is the reason why we used the line so we can see the growth rates. And remember, these are the standard air bars. And you'll see that the standard air bars don't overlap with the non-infected leaves, the beetles that fit on the non-infected affected leaves. And you see that, that the standard air bars do overlap for the beetles that fed on the virus. So there's no significant difference for beetles that fed on the virus to each other, the two different viruses, but they're both significantly different than the beetles that fed on, on the non-infected or healthy plants. So again, what is the reason for this? Well, we didn't test, we don't know what the reason is. We presume that there's plant defenses are different, that the plant defenses are weaker towards the beetle and the virus infected plant. But it may be for other reasons. Maybe the virus is more nutritious. We really don't know unless we do more experiments to test and figure that out. But clearly the virus seems to provide some growth benefit for the beetle. So we, we would presume that the beetle would prefer to feed on a virus infected plant versus a non-infected plant. It makes sense, right? What is the benefit of being growing better on a virus infected plant if you don't want to eat it? So we wanted to test whether or not virus infected, you know, the adults would prefer to feed on virus infected plants. And what would be the benefit they're more likely to lay their eggs on it, right? So if, if the mother beetle flies over and prefers to eat on virus infected plants, she'll lay her young, her eggs on those virus infected plants. And then those um, beetles will hatch, those larvae, and grow faster. If they grow faster and bigger, they're gonna have a better fitness. They're gonna lay more eggs, they're gonna you know, be more successful. So it's a benefit to be a big beetle. Again, our null hypothesis, our hypothesis would be there's a benefit, they would choose to eat the virus infected plants. The null hypothesis would be no difference. And the alternative would be they prefer to feed non-infected plants to infected plants. So how do you test these kind of experiments? How do you design these kind of experiments? It may be a little bit more difficult than you might imagine. So, you know, think about the kind of experiments you would set up. How would you set up these experiments? Well, let's tell, let me tell you how we did it then. Again, um, you know, there's lots of different ways to test it. But what I had the students do was go in, collect um, leaf discs from virus infected plants whether it be southern bean mosaic virus or bean bottle model virus, and compare it to non-infected leaves. It may have been better just to let the beetles run around in a natural system, but again, there were some limitations, so we did it in the classroom 
trial and error experiment in a Petri dish. This is our Petri dish. And so each one of these treatments is a random, I mean, while it says virus, we know one is virus, um, non-damaged plants, and I'll tell you to explain this a little bit more. And then we have two virus. So this is a leaf disc that came from a virus infected plant that was damaged, like a caterpillar or a beetle would have fed on it. That's what I mean by when I say damaged. Um, then we have no virus, non-damaged, and then we have no virus damaged. So in other words, it came from a plant that was damaged, but there was an infection. And then we let the beetles run around and feed and see which leaf disc they preferred. Now there's a lot of things we could have done to test it maybe more accurately. We could have weighed the leaf disc before and after to get an idea of how much the leaf disc was eaten. Or we could take pictures with high-tech software and figure out how much leaf disc was eaten. Um, we took a much simpler approach because you gotta remember back then compared to now, scanners and stuff was just not as available. You could still do it, you could come up with grids and come up with a system. Uh, but we were doing things on the cheap when I had students and we we're trying to get things done pretty rapidly. So what I did was I let them rate the amount of damage and I blinded the person rating them to what treatments they were looking at. They just had to give me a percentage so that they wouldn't have their own bias to put into it. So that's one of the things is try to remove as much bias that you as a researcher have in it. So I selected this student who was a research assistant for me at the time to go through and give me a, a rating of damage to not, you know, and how much feeding occurred on these different leaf discs for these various treatments. And she didn't know which treatment was what, she just rated them. We didn't, got an average and did statistics. Here's the leaf disc, so you can see what they look like. So you can see that this leaf disc is really torn up. This look how much damage has occurred. And then you can kind of see how many leaf discs were not bothered with. If you look at virus infected plants, you'll see that more of the leaf discs were damaged than the, the non-virus treatments. So if you look at the number of non-virus treatments, there's quite a few more that aren't damaged, even though there's still those extremes down here. But overall, there's probably about a 20% increase in damage on these leaves than on these leaves. So there appears to be at least some preference for virus infected leaf discs. And again, it looks like it's probably around 20 to 30% increase in preference. Looking at around 40 replicates, that's what number N equals 40. This is the statistical test we did. We did a NOVA followed by a Fisher's LSD. Um, the y-axis is the percentage of leaf discs eaten. Now, the question we had is what was causing, what was driving the preference? Was it the smell of the leaf disc? Was it the sight of the leaf disc? Are they visual eaters? Are they smelling volatiles? And, and so what was interesting is the, their interest in virus versus non-virus leaves seemed to disappear as soon as you put them in the dark, suggesting that maybe they're more interested in virus infected leaves based on the visual cues of the leaves. There's a, there must be some, maybe some difference in the appearance that the beetle's picking up on. That's the argument that we got from this initial result, because there was no difference in preference when we put the beetles into the dark. And so they couldn't see the, the, the brightness or the colors of the leaves. We know that the, so here we see no difference in preference in the dark. Now in the light, we saw a preference. So again, this provided evidence that maybe it's a visual cue. So these results indicated that adult beetles prefer to feed on virus infected leaves under like conditions. They have no preference for virus infected 
or non-infected leaves this in dark conditions. So we wanted to determine whether the dark conditions reduced beetle activity. Maybe they just don't move around and eat that much in the dark. And how would you test that in pure darkness? It's easier said than done. If I said, here, here's a beetle, we're putting it in a Petri dish. I want you to tell me if it's active in pitch darkness. How would you go about testing that? Because if you put a camera in there, you're not gonna you're gonna have bring you're gonna provide light. So we tried all sorts of things. We tried adding some talcum powder to see if they would walk around. We painted their feet to see if they leave little footprints, to see if they're just active in the dark. All that was pretty silly, because all that kind of stuff killed the beetles. <laughs> but through kind of a uh, accidental good luck kind of thing, we found that if we steamed the lid of a Petri dish and left that little misty water film, these little droplets, we could put the beetle into a cupboard and then we could go back and look at the trails it made. So it gave us evidence, this is beetle trails in the steamed versus the, nope, and you don't see any beetle trails here, that the beetles do walk around in the dark. So it seems like their preference for the virus infected leaves tends to be due to the visual cues of the leaves. They'll still eat in the dark, they'll still walk around in the dark, but they just can't really discern what type of beans they're eating in the dark. So this is what it means, they're pretty active they're a little bit more active in the light than in the dark. I will see everybody in 10 minutes. So we'll come back on in 10 minutes. Okay, so the point was again that we found out that the beetles were active in the dark. And the funny thing is, again, what I'm hoping you'll understand by going back a slide is we tried all sorts of different things to try to figure out whether or not these beetles were active in the dark because we didn't have the ability to see what the beetles were doing. And, you know, beetles don't leave a lot of big footprints. It's very obvious. So, again, we went through this trial and error where we tried fluorescent dye on their feet. We put some powder in there like carborundum or flour or whatever. All these different things to try to get whether or not these, they're walking around or they're just sitting still in the dark. We didn't really know. But again, it was just by us pouring some Petri dishes with some auger in it, thinking that maybe we could see a footprint in the auger, but noticing that the steam was so much better and then watching them walk around the steam. So just realize a lot of times when you're setting up your experimental design, you may want to do a small preliminary experiment first. One or a couple of them. And the reason why is there's lots of things you cannot really pre predict is going to happen. And so, you know, sometimes I've seen people kind of give up on an experiment um, where they think there's no difference or whatever. But in reality is they didn't really plan the experiment well enough to see that difference. They didn't think about all their experimental treatments and a good control treatment and so forth. If you recall back um, one of my earlier talks when we were discussing uh, tobacco plants and how the caterpillar spit could suppress the induction of nicotine. In those early experiments, I would just punch one hole into a leaf and paint the leaf with the caterpillar spit. And then I'd have a control treatment like water or non-wounded. And I didn't see much difference among all these three treatments. So I really started thinking there was no difference, which doesn't make any sense because the literature had shown that wounded tobacco plants um, had higher levels of nicotine. So it was only through trial and error where I realized, oh, I need to put five or six good holes into this leaf before I would see a difference in the treatments. So, don't real, so just realize sometimes 
your experiments and your hypothesis are correct, you just don't have a good experimental setup yet. So that's why it's sometimes good to do a small scale experiment first. And the other thing I see sometimes with new researchers and students that are into research is they kind of expect they'll do some kind of experiment, maybe get one or two little results, and then they're ready to start publishing. And they don't realize that nowadays, you know, it takes quite a few, especially depending on the field, it takes quite a few studies and experiments to piece together this story and a good argument before you can publish it. So again, it's kind of like, uh, science is like being a detective. Here you are uh, piecing together this uh, crime scene if you're a detective and then you make an argument that you're gonna take to trial. You don't just look at one bit of data. You try to put as much together as you can. Or you, you know, and it doesn't, and this is true for almost any area of science. You're building up an argument ultimately. And so this realized that a lot of times there's gonna be some trial and error until you get your experimental design down. I've seen it over and over again and this is about any lab. They have lots of hurdles. I know Lindsay's in the background. I mean, how many times did your tissue cultures get infected with some fungi? I mean, there's always some kind of trial and error. Well, we have, um, we, we added an antibacterial and an antifungal, so it doesn't happen anymore. Yeah, but the point is, is it did at the beginning. Yeah, and it did. Then you, and then you learn how to overcome it. Yeah. So again, they love to eat in the dark too. If you put the beetles onto it, the leaf and just set them on top of it, they'll start chowing down on it in light and dark conditions. Again, providing evidence that their preference towards the infected leaves tends to be something of a visual cue of some sort. So again, there's no, we don't see any preferences. They eat, they move around in the dark, but they just don't have that preference for virus versus non-virus in the dark. So this might mean that, that they're not picking up on a volatile cue. They may not be picking up on a smell difference between infected plants and non-infected plants. Again, this is just an argument, right? We have to do, there's still be other experiments we could try to test. So we had an idea about the beetle grew better on virus infected plants, but uh, we don't know whether or not the virus benefits by the beetle damaging the plant initially. Our argument was that if the beetle fed on the plant initially, the plant would be more susceptible to the virus, that the beetle would trigger the jasminate pathway and then thus make the plant more susceptible to the virus, which is normally part of the systemic acquired resistance pathway or the salicylic acid pathway. So again, we thought the beetle would stimulate the jasminate pathway and suppress the salicylic acid pathway, making the plant more susceptible to the virus when the beetle fed on it. So that was our objective, try to figure out whether or not that was true. So here's how we set up this particular experiment. We have these clip cages where we put the beetle onto the clip cage and let it feed. And we call that the primary leaf. It's the first fully expanded leaf that we, that we saw. And we would allow either beetle feeding, artificially wounding the leaf. So we would put holes into the leaf, small holes, or we left the leaf non-wounded and we still clipped put a clip cage onto it. We then collected the virus sap and then we spent some time diluting it until we found a percentage of the sap that would infect roughly 50% of the bean plants. And then we look at whether or not the fed on plants are more resistant or more susceptible to virus infection in comparison to the control treatment. So here's the students collecting sap from virus infected leaves using a garlic press and so the sap would be poured into here. And again, the sap would have 
virus infection and then we would dilute it with you know some water maybe 50 percent or so then we would place the carborundum on it now remember the carborundum is the silica from diatoms so it's kind of like a little bit of sandpaper we would take the sap and just lightly rub the leaf with that sap and then we look at what percentage of the plant was infected and so this is what we found out this is the percentage of plants infected um, if it was non-wounded we found that more plants were infected than if the beetle fed on the plant or if it was artificially wounded so I want you to back up for a minute and think about what my hypothesis was. What did I think was going to happen? Morgan or Lindsay or Kylie or anyone want to add, what did I think was going to happen? Your hypothesis was that these beetles would have a higher weight when they ate on, on plants that were infected versus not infected with the virus. Yes, but what did I expect would happen to the infection rate after the beetle mm -hmm. fed? Yeah. So let's back up for a minute and look at the hypothesis one more time. Or objective. We are interested in determining whether virus and its beetle vector benefit each other by co-suppressing plant resistance. So I wanted to determine if bean plants bean plants fed upon by Mexican bean beetles are more susceptible to the bean pod model virus or southern bean mosaic virus. So my hypothesis was that if the beetle fed on the plant first, the plant would uh, be more likely to get infected, which would be a benefit to the virus. Again, you got to go back to that idea of the jasmine pathway and the salicylic acid pathway. If the beetle is feeding on the plant, stimulating this jasmine, it'll suppress the salicylic acid pathway. And in doing so, make the plant more susceptible to the virus, more likely to become infected. But what did the results show? So the bean plants were fed on by beetles, artificially wounded, left non-wounded. We waited a few days, tried to infect the other leaf. So we let the beetles feed, take the clip cages off. The next day we rubbed the, the leaf with the virus. And then we look at the percentage of infection. What is my hypothesis? So if I expect, the, if my hypothesis is what? If the beetles feed, we're gonna see a higher infection rate. That's my hypothesis. If we artificially wound a plant, maybe we'll see higher infection rates in comparison to the non wound Because again, the argument is that a wounded plant it's going to be more susceptible to the virus infection because that jasmine A pathway has been turned on, suppressing the virus pathway. But what did my results reveal or show? Is this the, is my hypothesis being demonstrated? No, no. I actually have to reject it. Yeah, good job. I have to reject my hypothesis and accept the alternative hypothesis, which is that wounded plants, beetle or artificially wounded, but particularly beetle plants, wounded plants, are more susceptible to virus infection. They're more susceptible. Oh, excuse me. Back up. They're less susceptible, right? <laughs> Not to confuse you, I kind of confuse you. This is the percentage of plants affected. If beetles fed on it, 
or artificially wounded, the infection rate is lowered. My hypothesis was it was going to be higher. Does everybody see that? So I had to reject my hypothesis, but the alternative hypothesis is being demonstrated. So what does a good scientist do? Do they just don't publish the re results? No, you, you publish the alternative hypothesis and come up with a new reason for why that happened that way. Because what is the one perspective we didn't think about? Now, it might not be influenced by these hormones in the way that we understand, right off the top of our heads, but we know that these bean plants have evolved with beetles feeding on them and that they're, when that wound, when the plants are being wounded, they're more likely to be infected because that wounding is what opens up holes that the virus can leak into and get into. So it makes sense for plants to um, turn on some of their resistance towards viruses. It's not what my hypothesis was. My hypothesis was that the beetle feeding would make the plants have a higher chance of being infected. But in fact, they were actually were lowered, had a lowered infection rate. So you just come up with another story, another evolutionary story change that, and you go publish your paper. So you can have results where your hypothesis is opposite of what you think, but you still have publishable results. Now, if there was no difference, that might just be an interesting note in a paper, but it probably wouldn't be the headline, right? It probably wouldn't be the focus. It'd just be a little side note, we didn't see any differences. But now we have a clear result that beetle wounding made the plants more resistant to the virus. It wasn't necessarily to the benefit of the beetle or the virus, but it was a benefit to the bean plant. So the bean plant has its own agenda too, right? So just another way of thinking about it. I hope that makes sense. So just realize you're going to have hypotheses that are not going to work out and then you just come up with another conclusion and explain what you think is happening. We saw this a couple times. Now in the beetle spit, in this case, it's regurgitant. The beetles don't actually have salivary glands like caterpillars do. <clears throat> but in the regurgitant of these beetles is ribonuclease. There's our beetle again. I'm hoping you know what ribonuclease is. You should be able to know by its name, particularly being biologist or chemist. If there's an ace at the end, what do we know when every time we see ASE? Well, we know it's an enzyme. If it's a nuclease, you know that it's gonna break down nucleotides. If it's a ribonucleus, you know it's gonna break down RNA. So this is a RNase, ribonuclease. So it breaks down RNA. And do you remember that the virus is an RNA virus? And the other thing that I haven't really gotten into much, but it seems that um, microRNAs, has anybody ever heard of a microRNA? It's just a small segment of RNA, is important in aspects of the immune system. And it's actually important in some regards to plant defenses. I'm not sure what degree and where it's at in this point, but we know that micro RNAs are important in some aspects of signaling and transcriptions and all that kind of stuff at the molecular level. And seems to trigger plant defenses to some level. So we decided to wound plants and paint ribonuclease on and see whether or not the infection rate is different. Is the saliva of this beetle having an effect in this case, it's regurgitant. 
So the student uh, punched some holes into the leaf and we painted on ribonuclease. For our control treatment, we painted on water or the buffer that the ribonuclease is normally in. We allow beetle feeding to occur or caterpillar feeding to occur. And then we measured the plant defenses in regards to infection rate. In this case, we measured the number of lesions. Again, the infection rate, or in this case, the lesion numbers are higher in non-wounded plants. So non-wounded plants are again, more susceptible to virus infection than wounded plants. It seems like ribonuclease does have an effect. So does the beetle feeding. But interestingly enough, so does caterpillar feeding. This is caterpillar H. zea, Helicoverpa zea. So it too has an effect. So all these wounded treatments trigger um, the resistance of the plant to the virus. Artificially wounding and painting water on doesn't seem to have as much of an effect. So it does provide evidence that ribonuclease from the beetle, and maybe the caterpillars have it too, who knows, that it's triggering the plants to have a resistance to the virus. So our conclusions were that the bean leaves treated with ribonuclease, RNase A, fed upon by insects had increased virus resistance. This was the first time that ribonuclease had been shown to stimulate plant defenses. Beetles prefer to feed on virus infected leaf discs and beetles grow better on virus infected bean plants. So half of my hypothesis demonstrated to be correct that the beetles grow better on virus infected plants. We don't know why. We would have to do more experiments to figure that out. And there's other things in the literature that we should look at too. And we know that the plants are more resistance, resistant to virus infection after beetle feeding, possibly due to the ribonuclease. But again, that wasn't what my initial hypothesis was. And one of the things that we really got into back in the day was we had the students do posters. So the students presented these posters from doing summer research projects with us. So they got some pretty good experience. I'd like to know how many went on to do some science careers, but haven't, I lost touch with most of them, well, all of them but one. Does anybody have any questions in regards to this research? So these are research projects that initially started in the summer. We had a good time. And then they were carried on as me with a, as a grad student um, afterwards and then we're published. Okay, so I'm gonna go ahead and stop recording.